Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Buchanan, and the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida. Mr. Speaker, I ask for unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials in H.R. 5456 currently under consideration. Without objection. Mr. C Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The nation is in the grips of opioid and heroin epidemic, which, according to the states, is responsible for recent spikes and the need for out-of-home foster care placement after more than a decade of decline. Under current child welfare financing, when a family is struggling, the majority of federal dollars are only available if the state removes a child from his or her biological and adoptive home and places that child in foster care. Even though it's often less expensive and more effective to keep the child's safety at home, federal support for these types of prevention services are extremely limited. Children who are raised by the state in foster care face increased risk of substance abuse, homelessness, teen pregnancy, and other negative outcomes. The, first fa the Family First Prevention Service Act of 2016 will reserve the current trends by supporting early evidence-based, cost-effective intervention to keep children safely at home. This will increase the likelihood of positive short-term and long-term outcomes for both children and their parents. Moreover, it will ensure that children who do not need foster care are appropriately placed with families whenever possible. Preliminary, preliminary estimates are that the cost of the upfront prevention services to strengthen families will be more than fully offset by both reducing inappropriate placement into group homes for foster children, as well as briefly delaying additional adoption assistance to allow for a comprehensive GAO review to be completed. In May, the Human Resources Subcommittee heard about challenges and successes of those on the ground as they attempt to fight the opioid and heroin epidemic in their communities. Today, we will move forward to ensure more struggling families get the help they so vitally need. This bill is a result of a bipartisan, bicameral effect. So I would like to thank Ranking Member Levin and our Senate Finance Committee colleagues, Chairman Hatch and Ranking Mem Member Wyden, for working so dil diligently on this effort. This bill, is also, this bill also incorporates bipartisan effort by Congressman Young and Congressman Davis to improve the exchange of information across state lines to get foster children settled into homes more quickly. I would like to thank my fellow committee members, this bipartisan group of the original co-sponsors and those off the committee who have also joined to sponsor this important legislation. Finally, I would like to recognize the overwhelming support we have received from child welfare community who I know have this issue for many, many years, some say as long as 30 years in terms of the prevention care for our kids. I ask unanimous consent to insert some of these more than 60 letters of support we have received so far on this bill. Without objection. With that, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman serves. The gentleman from Michigan is rec recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself such time as I shall consume. Without objection. The bill before us today, the Family First Prevention Services Act, has a very simple goal. Improve the lives of our most vulnerable children. We worked across the aisle on this legislation because we recognize the importance of ensuring that kids grow up in safe, loving, and stable homes. I mentioned that we worked together on this, uh, the gentleman, Mr. Buchanan, Chairman of our committee and others on the Republican side, Mr. Doggett, to whom I will yield the balance of our time, and Mr. Davis, uh, Ms. Bass, Representative Bass, and others worked so hard on this, and I think it has improved this legislation. Our foster care system provides an essential haven, an essential safe haven for abused and neglected children. However, when it comes to our system today, it's clear that federal funding has been stacked against prevention efforts. That means our federal dollars aren't being used to effectively help families and prevent child abuse 
and neglect in homes. In fact, less than 10% of dedicated child welfare funding goes toward prevention. This bill is intended to make sure families receive the help they need before a child goes into foster care, not after, as our current system largely functions. This bill would provide substance abuse treatment for parents, support efforts to improve parenting skills, and expand access to mental health care. The Child Children's Defense Fund, which tirelessly advocates for our most vulnerable children, offers its full support for this bill. And it's my privilege to um, quote the Defense Fund under its so esteemed leader, and I quote, it takes historic and long overdue steps to direct federal child fair welfare dollars to improve outcomes for vulnerable children and families, end of quote. Simply put, this bill would help keep kids throughout our country safe and in their homes instead of placing them in a foster care system that we should use only when clearly necessary. It would be preferable if the bill's key provisions on prevention started sooner to help states facing immediate crises. Furthermore, this legislation certainly does not address every problem facing our child welfare system, including the need to recruit, to recruit more foster family homes. But indeed, this bill is an important step forward in strengthening our nation's child welfare system in the long term. In fact, as we've seen, more than 50 organizations dedicated to advocating for vulnerable children have come out in support of this legislation, including, as mentioned, the Children's Defense Fund, the American Academy of Pediatrics, Child Abuse America, the American Psychological Association, Voice for Adoption, and the North American Council on Adoptable Children. This bill has also been endorsed by the National Association representing state child welfare agency directors. So this legislation represents an effort to find important common ground in the House and also in the Senate with the leadership of Senators Hatch and Wyden. We have more work to do. We have more work to do, indeed, to ensure our children have the opportunities and support they need to thrive. But this bill would take a very important step on that path. So once again, I would like to thank my colleagues on the Republican side and on the Democratic side. And I'd like to thank the staff on our side, and I'm sure the same has been true of the Republican side, for all of their diligent and impassioned work on this important issue. With that, I reserve the balance of our time. And as indicated, Mr. Speaker, I would now ask that the balance of our time be now governed and managed by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett. Without objection. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Florida. Having no other res uh, speakers, I reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. I would yield myself five minutes. The gentleman is yielded five minutes. Each day in America, as many as eight children die at the hands of those who are supposed to be caring for them. Three out of four of these children are under the age of three. Half of them will never reach their first birthday. And countless others of all ages will forever be scarred by abuse and by neglect. The legislation that we consider tonight is all that remains of a comprehensive child safety bill offered by Senator Ron Wyden and offered by me here in the House last year. I salute his leadership then, and I accept his decision to settle for a small bit of what we sought to accomplish rather than no bit at all. This year, Senator Wyden put a fraction of our original bill
to a proposal to which Senator Orrin Hatch agreed a bipartisan family first draft proposal. Today's bill is a fraction of a fraction of our original initiative. Despite the valiant efforts of many local groups and individuals across Texas, we have a child abuse crisis there. As the Dallas Morning News reported last month, quote, staggering numbers of Texas children in imminent danger neglected by CPS, Child Protective Services, investigation shows. And the same is true in one state after another. In short, the Republican answer in this bill is to do absolutely nothing with regard to child prevention services and additional resources now, to essentially do nothing about this crisis now, to continue neglecting the neglected this year, next year, and the year after that. You know, adoption has proven one way that we can keep children out of the foster care system and in a loving family. The only way that House Republicans, and I know this is not and its personal view, but the only way that House Republicans would agree for us to fund additional preventive services for these children to avoid child abuse, even though that takes three long, painful years of delay, the only way they would do that is by our cutting about $700 million from adoption. The other source of funding is congregate or group care, and I believe we do need a change in group care. But while agreeing, I note that in Texas last month, there were over 60 foster care youth. The only place they could find to sleep was in the state offices of Child Protective Services. And one has to ask about this bill, the question of where these children will go if those group facilities are no longer available. And this measure was approved on the same day that the Ways and Means Committee approved borrowing over $50 billion for additional tax breaks and yet not another dime of additional resources to prevent child abuse uh, this year. They demanded that there could be no resources going into child abuse unless it was paid for from other human resources, essentially robbing Peter to pay Paul. One important aspect of the bill uh, is the kinship provision, that assisting relatives who are willing to raise a child, keep them in a family home, uh, so they won't be bounced around from one place to another, that they get some support. I think it's a worthy approach, but it also shows how this House Republican proposal has slashed relief. This year's bipartisan recommendation by Senators Wyden and Hatch was estimated to cost $1.7 billion for kinship. Today, we have a 8 percent, 8 percent of what they recommended hardly worthy of a celebration. The major focus of this bill is to provide a federal incentive for the states to invest in prevention and early intervention to assure the safety of children. For too long, we backloaded everything, abuse we responded to after it occurred, instead of trying to prevent it in the, at the beginning. We offer assistance now through this bill eventually and we should be focused on it. I agree fully with that focus. That's why I plan to vote reluctantly for this proposal. But this bill would give the states an incentive through what's called Title IV-E, where the federal government would put up 50 percent, 50 cents on the dollar that's expended. I yield myself another 30 seconds, and the states would put Without up objection. 50 cents. Unfortunately, this bill provides no immediate relief for children that are in danger right now. No additional funds for three years. In Texas, with the opioid crisis, in other states, these children need help now. It's gotten so bad that federal courts are beginning to declare these systems unconstitutional. We could have done better by these children. We have the capacity to do better. We have not had the will to do better in this Congress. Uh, I uh, reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Florida. Having no other speaker, I reserve. The gentleman reserves. 
The gentleman from Texas. Thank you. At this point, I would uh, uh, recognize for five minutes one of the members of our committee who's been a real advocate uh, for uh, children suffering from abuse, uh, Mr. Danny Davis from Illinois. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank my colleague from Texas for yielding. Child welfare advocates have used the adjectives landmark, historic, and trailblazing to describe this bill. And I wholeheartedly agree with them. And I'm pleased to be a co-sponsor of this legislation that begins a fundamental shift in federal child welfare policy to preserving families rather than separating them. I am deeply grateful to Ranking Member Levin, Chairman Brady, Chairman Buchanan, Ranking Member Wyden, and Chairman Hatch for including many Just provisions to be able to serve with a legendary which I have advocated American hero provisions like that will John substantially Lewis was such an strengthen honor. families in and he Chicago, said to me on the House in floor, Illinois, he said, and throughout the nation. Young man, are you the, the I'm new equally guy? grateful to Ranking Member Doggett for his tireless efforts to secure additional resources for prevention. My congressional district has the highest percentage of children living with grandparent caregivers in the nation, followed closely by two other congressional districts in Illinois. We know that substance abuse and addiction underlie a substantial percentage of child welfare cases and separate families. When I asked foster youth what policymakers could do to make child welfare better, they almost always say, you could have helped my mom and dad. And that is exactly what we're doing here today. The Family First Prevention Services Act invests in addressing key reasons that families struggle by providing evidence-based mental health, substance abuse, and parenting services to strengthen families so they can avoid the child welfare system. I am especially pleased that the bill includes my work to improve the effectiveness of child abuse and neglect prevention related to substance abuse by modernizing the regional partnership grants. Coupled with the prevention services, the extension of the Kinship Navigator Program, the improved licensing standards to address barriers for relative caregivers, the extension of adoption and legal guardianship incentive payments, the new services for pregnant and parenting foster youth, the investment in electronic systems to improve interstate placement of youth, and the funding to support children in staying with their parents in residential treatment, all promise to improve permanency and well-being for youth and kinship caregivers. I want to thank the chairperson of my Child Welfare Task Force, Dr. Netta Wilson, for sharing her expertise on how to improve policies to support children and families. I also want to thank Pam Rodriguez and George Williams with TASC in Chicago, as well as Nancy Young with Children and Family Futures for sharing their expertise about what policies work to support parents affected by substance abuse so that we can strengthen families. Finally, this is not a perfect bill, but it is a historic bill and a unique opportunity to strengthen families. I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues to enact additional supports for kinship caregivers, enhanced services for expectant and parent and foster youth, and to protect the Social Security benefits of foster youth. I attended a high school graduation last Friday, and the young lady who got the biggest applause was one whose mother and grandmothers both had died within the last three years. 
She also has given birth to two children, but she graduated with honors, and it is the assistance and help that we give to these young people who really prove that we can have an effective welfare help system for young people who need the help. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Florida. Yeah, we have no other speakers. I reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman what time from remains? Texas. What time remains, Mr. Speaker? The gentleman has five minutes remaining. All right. Mr. Speaker, uh, at this time I yield uh, three minutes to the gentlewoman from California, who, though not a formal member of our committee, has been a very active participant uh, in our subcommittee and who chairs the uh, bipartisan foster care uh, caucus, among others, uh, Ms. Karen Bass from California. The gentlewoman from California is recognized. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of H.R. 5456. I believe this is a very positive step forward to reforming the child welfare system in our country. H.R. 5456 takes into account what has been learned from years of county and state efforts at reform in the form of waivers. We've learned a lot. We've learned that we can safely reduce the numbers of children in care by providing services up front, prevention services that until now could not be supported with federal dollars unless the state or county had a waiver. What do we know? We know that the main reason why children are in foster care is because of child neglect. And the main reason for this is substance abuse and mental illness. For example, there are programs such as Shields for Family in Los Angeles that has been able to reduce the number of children in care by providing substance abuse services for families for 12 months. The problem with H.R. 5456, however, is that services would be cut off after, four mo after 12 months. And taking addiction, one of the features of addiction is relapse. So what happens to a family if the individual relapse on the 11th month? Will the children automatically be removed and placed into care? I think during the implementation phase, we need to consider flexibility with cutting off services at the end of 12 months. The same thing applies to mental health services. The Chafee grants is another thing that is a positive feature of H.R. 5456. Chafee grants help young people transition to adulthood. I'm pleased that H.R. 5456 includes my language to extend time to 23 years old for a young person to receive prevention services. What these services are, are essentially services that help a young person transition to adulthood, such as housing, counseling, job training, et cetera. Chafee is also extended in H.R. 5456 to the age of 26 for educational grants. I want to applaud my state of California where reforms are underway. We've passed legislation in California that long recognizes the need for housing to transition young people out of care. But in California, we have had the insight and foresight to understand that children 16 years old sometimes want to transition out of the foster care system. Unfortunately, H.R. 5456 eliminates funding for children who are 16 years old. I'm concerned that the bill might have some unintended consequences. I think we would all agree that it would be best to keep a child in a family setting when they're 16 years old. However, many young people wind up running away from foster homes. Unfortunately, they wind up suffering from abuse again in a foster home, and they need to be transitioned into adulthood. I'm hoping, could I ask for another 30 seconds? 15 seconds. Uh, I'm hoping that H.R. 5456 will take into consideration unintended consequences and not uh, contribute to homelessness amongst youth. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. The Sorry, gentleman from Florida. Sorry. We have no other speakers. I reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman speaker, I yield myself uh, one minute. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, four years ago, uh, I authored and passed into law the Protect Our Kids Act. It became law with the help of former 
Ways and Means Republican Chair Dave Camp, and it established a commission to eliminate child abuse and neglect fatalities. It is a mark of the progress or the lack of progress that this year, when that commission came forward with its report, Republicans on our committee would not permit a hearing to accept the modest findings of the commission. And so we've reached tonight. I was offered, uh, in the traditional Washington way, an opportunity to put my name on this legislation. It has some meritorious provisions that eventually come into effect. But I could not do that and face my constituents in Texas saying that I had done something to address this crisis when I know, in fact, we are not doing what needs to be done to address this crisis. I advanced one of many alternatives to provide the dollars to deal with this crisis now. I yield my, how much time remains, Mr. Speaker? 45 seconds. Mr. Speaker, uh, that was a proposal not for new taxes. I yield myself the balance of my time. The gentleman is right Not for new taxes, uh, but it was a proposal for tax compliance that would have fully funded the bipartisan agreement from the Senate, but for the ideological commitment to oppose any new resources going to address child abuse, we would have those dollars. We wouldn't be taking the money out of good adoption programs. We wouldn't be delaying a response for three years. We would be doing something now to address the challenges that are out there, the children that face abuse and neglect today. That's what should be happening. That's what today's bill fails to do, though it offers us the promise of eventual action to do what we should be doing right now, and I yield back. It's expired. The gentleman from Florida. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Again, this is a bipartisan, bicameral legislation, takes important steps to keep more children safely at home and out of foster care. Under the current law, most federal funding for child welfare is directed towards reimbursing states after they place a child in foster care. This is the least desirable outcome. This legislation turns this around by putting resources towards preventative services to keep children safely with their parents or relatives. Most importantly, this bill will help ensure that more children grow up in a safe home surrounded by a stable family. Strong families make for a strong community, so I urge my colleagues to support the Family First Prevention Service Act, and with that, I yield back the remainder of my time. 